Can we thank the students and the praise team for leading us this morning? Yeah, Heavenly Father, as we turn your heart, our hearts, excuse me, to your message, Lord, for us uh, today, uh, we pray that we would be prepared to hear what we need to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have a problem with my phone. And of course, I thought this would be the place to air this out to everyone. So when I go to my photos, maybe you have this problem. I keep on getting, I keep on getting this notification that it's full and I'm going to need to buy more iCloud space. Anyone else have this problem? Like everybody, right? It's a trick. Don't buy into it. That's not what the sermon is about, but... I tell you what, I could go through the 4,527 pictures and videos and delete a bunch of them. I could do that, but they're precious to me. Not as precious, though, as these pictures in my wallet. My wife has no idea I'm doing this, but this is a picture, the only one I know of, of her in high school. Forty years, no, <laughs> sorry, I had to say something goofy. Yeah, this is even more so precious to me. Kids, I know this is hard to understand, but this is not digital. It can't, you can't, you, like, you just erase it or throw it in a trash. It's on a piece of paper. I know. And it's precious to me because it's the only one. There's a an image far deeper and more precious than something we see on the outside, but one that God has given us to display for His glory. And we're going to talk about that image today as we continue in our sermon series in Exodus 20. So go there with me. Exodus 20, we're going to be at chapter 13. Chapter 13, and I want you to see for yourself what God tells us in this commandment about about life. So if the Ten Commandments were just merely a checklist, we might write them out on a piece of paper, type them out and print them, and maybe put them on a desk at home or at work, and we might on a daily basis or a weekly basis go to this checklist, and we might check them off like, these 1 through 10, like, okay, I did this one, okay, I didn't do this one, that's good. And, and we might treat them that way if they were a checklist, but they're not merely a checklist. But if they were, when we got to commandment number 5, the one we're on today, we might say something like this, well, I've never murdered anyone, and I'm not planning on it, so I got this one. Right? Right? But they're not merely a checklist. They are rules and regulations that formulate really the very foundations of society. They are, they are laws that we can apply our laws to. They are, in a sense, regulations, but they're so much more than all of these things. So therefore, we shouldn't be really treating them merely as just a set of rules and Christianity as just these sets of rules that we are to walk in and live by, and therefore we will be accepted by God if we do that. No, the story of Sinai and what God is doing in Israel is a part of His great redemptive story. How God saved Israel by the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost when the angel of death came to take the firstborn. How God would lead them through Moses' leading out of slavery and across the Red Sea, on dry ground, the waters of the sea, and now into Sinai where they would stand before the glory of God and He would give them Torah or law. This is where God shows Israel their need for salvation. 
Back to the commandment, let me read it for you. Exodus 20.13 Thou shalt not murder. You might say, well, that's kind of a heavy subject, Pastor. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. This will be the last time you smile throughout the rest of the sermon. (laughs) Yeah, it's heavy. No, but seriously, there's so much more to it than meets the eye. Obviously, to murder speaks directly to taking human life. God has commanded that we are not to be the ones who determine who gives and takes away. That's on Him. But the commandment comes with some questions. Like, how does it apply? Like, how do governments and leaders treat a law like this, and how should they be treated? There's a few questions I have about that. And I think that continues to this day. What about war, for example? What about gun laws? What about unintended but negligent accidents, like car accidents? Yes, the law here applies to these things, and yet, What I wanted to say to us as we would relate it to ourselves is, however the complexities of these matters, we don't want them to overshadow, especially in a setting like this, how they really are intended to be applied to our lives. So I'm going to begin with this, and I think by the end of the talk, you will realize that this is a very biblical way of going about it, and it's going to begin in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So if you'd like to go there with me, I encourage you to do it. Uh, this will also be up on the big giant Bible on the wall. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let me read it for you. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Do you notice us, our, right? Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So jumping down to 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And science is proving this to be true. Even DNA shows us that this is true. But I want you to notice, so God created man in his own image image. For as much as I have very little remorse in the month of July swatting a mosquito on my arm and its blood splattering everywhere, did I have to say that? Yes, I did. For as little remorse as I have for running into my daughter's room in the middle of the night when she's screaming, and I think someone's coming in the window, but instead it's a teeny little spider on the ceiling. Right, honey? It's unbelievable. I have learned not to make fun of her on this. Like, she has serious arachnophobia. Don't you play tricks on her. But for as little remorse as I have, squishing that thing in my hand and flushing it down the toilet, That is not this. Okay? That's the point. That is not this. Genesis 1.27 makes clear that we, and when I say we, humankind, you, I want you to take this personally, you are precious in the sight of God. And He proves that by creating you like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be made in God's image? It means that we are imprints of God. It means that we possess the character traits of who God is at His very core. And if we were to summarize this in just a two-point outline, as a good pastor likes to do cleanly, you know, two points, three points, that sort of thing, then we might say something like this. It starts with the most basic of our social, moral, mental, and eternal attributes. That being that God has made us eternal beings. What's the difference between you or me and this rock? I'm really asking. It's not the best illustration but it might drive 
home the point. What's the difference? You just give me some feedback between you and this rock. Okay, I didn't understand either of those. A um, <laughs> little bit louder. What's the difference between you? Life. Life. At its most, at, at its most basic, basic form, it's life. No other things have life. Other things are living. But it's the kind of life that we're speaking here to that gives us this. I guess, obvious contrast. It's his breath in your lungs. It's his word in your heart. You are made with dominion over other things like animals, for you are created to glorify and serve God eternally. Eternally. It's his eternity in our hearts. To be very, very specific... It's his eternity that he placed in Adam and Eve. That's his image. Like what Psalm 139, 15 and 16 tells us about he's one of us. My, my frame, it says, my frame, again, kind of talking about image here, was not hidden from you, God. It's not like you were... You were unaware of this. It's not like God left the universe to be on its own and all things then turned out random. No, it, it says that our frame was not hidden at all from Him. In fact, in, in fact, it was He who framed us when I was being, the psalmist says, made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Even... Well, you were matter. It's incredible what's being said here. But then it says this, verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Think about that. All your days were decided before you were even substance. God had already planned for your days before you were conceived. I cannot stress it enough. Church, hear me. Church, hear me. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to put others before ourselves. We are to seek peace and pursue it. We are to create environments of harmony rather than conflict. We are to honor the life God has given us and all those around us. We are to stand for life because we are image bearers. This has been a theme throughout the Ten Commandments. And this is also why Emmaus stands for life. This is why our heart is to see our sons and daughters protected. This is why I want to see babies live. This is why my family does fostering. This is why we have House of Hope and City Life Center and we support ministries like this and come alongside moms who need support just like I need support when I face crisis. This is why we do hard work. Things. This is why we engage complex issues like abortion and euthanasia and many other issues today. This is why we should be heartbroken when our teenagers are shot in our city streets. But remember, but remember, this is a warning, this is a caution. Remember, Standing upon convictions and dogmas is only a first step to standing for life as image bearers. We have to have the courage to engage what's going on in culture because we are called not just to have good judgment, but rather and foremost to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the broken heart of and set captives free. That's what we're called to. And this isn't easy. It is challenging. There is hardship in it. And yet, this is what God is doing in us. He is healing and He is mending and He is refining the perfect image that He gave to mankind that was destroyed by sin. 
And it continues to this day. Remember what Jesus said in John 10.10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. This is why we stand against things that are the like. That's of the devil. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it abundantly. When Jesus talked of the fifth commandment, He showed us the scope or the spectrum for which we should see this and how it should be applied to our life. I notice in Matthew 5, 21 and on through 26, it says, let me read it for you, you have heard that it was said to those of old, just really saying your ancestors, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, this is Jesus talking now, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. I thought Jesus only talked really kindly and nicely and didn't say anything that was controversial. Hmm. I guess we need to familiarize ourselves with the Word of God, don't we? Whoever has anger in their hearts, outbursts, is liable to judgment. Whoever is insulted, yeah, liable to judgment. Whoever has accused, eternal torment. The half-brother of Jesus, James, says in chapter 3 of, in verse 9, with the tongue... Church, hear this. With with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in the likeness of God. Have you ever um, showed up for church with your fancy clothes on? You guys look great, by the way. But have you ever showed up to church with your fancy clothes on and sang the praise of God and had just a great morning? Felt so good about what you had done. Feel really good about yourself and that you accomplished this incredible and heroic thing of showing up at church on a Sunday morning. (laughs) And then gone home and cursed someone out or said something rude or yelled at someone. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. Have you ever accused someone of something just to make yourself feel appeased for what you had done in the problem yourself? I'm convicted by Jesus' words that make very clear that even an insult is subject to judgment. Harm and murder is an outward action. On a spectrum, to us, it's way down on the list of what you're not supposed to do, something that maybe for us seems so extreme we'd never even get down there, and yet Jesus on the spectrum says, well, I'm not really saying one is better than the other. Like, I'm totally fine with you hating people. Just don't ever murder them. No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, same are subject to judgment. Some have greater consequences, but both are subject to judgment. And why is that? Because being made in God's image means that we are to be relational just as God is relational. This is kind of the second part, that that at its most basic level we were created in the image of God. And what that means is that we are eternal beings. But it also means that we possess the same character as the Trinity in that as image bearers we are relational first to God, created to have relationship with our God, and secondly, with one another. We are community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Which would be why, church, outbursts of anger, insults and accusations, we know come from a heart divided in hostility to what God desires of us. 
This is why division is the outcome of a heart separated from God's will or obedience to God's word. It means that living under the influence of the accuser, the great enemy, looks like being divided from one another. We all struggle, let's just be honest, we all struggle with hate on some level. The enemy seeks to kill and destroy relationship. And that's why around every corner we turn, we see more hostility, we see more selfishness, We see more prejudice. We see more contempt. It's why there is racism and classism. It's why we have dissension in every part of our lives. It's why even if we leave people behind and get away for a week, it's why if we go move to the woods, it's why if we just get away and don't have anyone around us, it still follows us in our mind and tempts our heart. Notice how Jesus follows his statement about the fifth commandment. He does it with these instructions. These aren't actually going to be up on the screen, but if you are following along, I'll read them quickly. Matthew 5, 23. It says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, it's talking about worship. If you're in worship... And there remember that your brother has something against you, or for that matter, you against him. Leave your gift, therefore, on the altar and go. Pause. Stop. Don't even go on with it. Leave it there. You can still give it. But go and says, first reconcile to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Thanks for putting that up for me. Verse 25, come to terms quickly. You see that? Slowly? No, quickly. Genuinely, but quickly. With your accuser. Jesus says, leave your offering. Leave your sacrifice. Leave your worship on the altar Pause and go and make reconciliation. Reunite. Find healing. Reconcile. Engage. Forgive. Find peace. I could go on and on. Because. Church. Because. Any conflict, any division, any discourse, inside or out, goes against the work that he has done for you and for me on the cross of Calvary. As his shed blood has brought reconciliation back with God, as our sins have been forgiven, and the image that was placed within each of us as being rebirthed. That's why. We are a picture of what God is doing in our lives. That's why we share testimony of how he restores. That's why we stand alongside those he's restoring as he is doing that work in our hearts. I wonder, what would the church look like if it was at peace with each other? I really do ask that question, and I ask it out of love and grace. What what would the world look like if we were a better picture of His grace? These questions and more I often find myself asking, and yet... As I think about our efforts, church, what I consider first is what God is doing in my heart, and let me explain what I mean by that. I'm so thankful that Jesus 
provides forgiveness and restoration. Because all of my efforts, they're not working. All the efforts in society going on today, they're not working. That doesn't mean they're all wrong. I'm saying they're not, they're not working. They're not, they're not bringing to completion or bringing true peace. Which is why I'm so thankful that Jesus provides forgiveness and restoration. I'm so glad that when I approach his throne room, there is grace for me. It begins in me. And this is the work of God in that he is making in us as he makes us more and more like his son Jesus who proclaimed these words and I'll say it in closing I came that they would have life and that they would have it abundantly would you pray with me Heavenly Father it is the life we proclaim today you're the Savior who we represent today and proclaim today It's your forgiveness and your shed blood on the cross that makes a way for us to walk in the life-giving, eternal blessing that can only be found in you. But it doesn't end there. Lord, you call us to go and engage in our gifting, in our place, You call us to engage. So that more and more would receive the same grace that we have received. So that others would know that the name of Jesus saves. If there's anyone here in this place that has never received Jesus into your heart and life, You can do that in this moment. And as we're praying together, I just want you to pray with me and to yourself. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and restore all of the brokenness of my sin, error, and wrong. And bring me into your kingdom as a son and daughter. For you have made me in your image to glorify your son. And as I am restored, you are purposing for me greater things that would be honoring and glorifying to you, my Savior and my God. Lord, do that work within all of us here, we pray. During the closing song, the altar will remain open for anyone who would like to receive prayer. Lord Jesus, be glorified as we sing praise, sing praise to you.